Welcome everyone. I think we'll get started. It's good to see so many of you here this evening. Uh, my name is Ingrid Erberg and I teach Scandinavian studies here on the Augustana campus. We acknowledge that the land on which we gather, traditionally known as Asiniskau, Asiniskau Sapisis Stony Creek, is Treaty 6 territory and a traditional meeting ground for many indigenous peoples. The land on which the Augustana campus of the University of Alberta is located provided a traveling route and home to the Musquachis, Nahiawak, Nisitapi, Nakoda, and Tsutsina nations, the Métis and other indigenous peoples. Their spiritual and practical relationships to the land create a rich heritage for our learning and our life as a community. It's a pleasure for me to introduce our guest this evening, Dr. Tom Dubois, who is a professor of Nordic Studies at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. There he's the current chair of the Department of German, Nordic, and Slavic Studies. In 2008, Tom was the keynote speaker at a joint meeting of the Canadian Society of Medievalists, and Brandon Alakis was there, uh, and the Association for the Advancement of Scandinavian Studies in Canada. We were at Congress in Regina, and we chatted about the possibility of Tom coming to the University of Alberta and this is now happening, thanks to the Scandinavian Trade and Cultural Society Endowment. Oops, I'm touching your computer there. Uh, <laughs> that's, I guess, thanking too. Uh, as well as support from the Department of Fine Arts and Humanities and the Chester Ronning Center for the Study of Religion in Public Life. I'd also like to thank Diane McGall for all her help with the practical arrangements and Sam Christensen. Tom Dubois, for those of us in Scandinavian Studies and Nordic Studies, doesn't really need an introduction, but this is a general audience, so I'm going to give you a bit of background information. Tom is a folklorist, and he received his PhD in Folklore and Folk Life from the University of Pennsylvania. As a folklorist, he teaches and conducts research on a range of topics having to do with the way people think about and use the idea of tradition in their lives. Most of his research focuses on Nordic cultures, especially Finnish and Sami, although he is increasingly interested in the relations of Nordic peoples and ideas coming from elsewhere, particularly the Celtic world. His recent research and service has also included work on the repatriation of traditions uh, of Wisconsin Ojibwe people, particularly at the Lac du Flambeau Reservation. His publication record is extensive. And his books include An Introduction to Shamanism, Nordic Religions in the Viking Age, and I think that image is on the cover of that book, uh, Finnish Folk Poetry, and The Kalevala. And The Kalevala is a 19th century work of epic poetry based on oral folklore, songs, and mythology. And my Scandinavian folk literature students were fortunate enough, fortunate enough to have Tom talk about The Kalevala to them today, and I see we have a number of those students here. In 2017, when Finland celebrated 100 years of being an independent country, Tom was the Finnish lecturer of the year and traveled around giving talks about the Kalevala. He has received a number of awards, including an honorary doctorate from the University of Umeå in northern Sweden, and he was inducted into the Finnish Academy of Sciences and Letters as a foreign <coughs> member in 2016. Tom's Nordic languages are Finnish, Sami, Swedish, and Old Norse, and he translates from Sami to English. I found out last evening that he has just returned from the rap, rap viewing of Frozen 2 in Los Angeles, since he was the consultant on Sami language and culture for the film. And he's actually the only person who teaches Sami uh, at the university level in, uh, at any rate in the United States, perhaps North America. The courses he teaches include Finnish language, a course on the Kalevala, survey of Scandinavian children's literature, an introduction to Sami culture, past and present, and a course on Scandinavian Celtic relations in the Viking Age. Uh, Tom also does substantial service work, and in his own words, I am a big believer in academic service, particularly in what we at the University of Wisconsin call the Wisconsin idea. <clears throat> that is the active engagement of the university with its surrounding constituencies. I make it a goal to bring academic scholars into productive dialogue with members of the broader public. And when I read that, I think about the Browning Center, 
um, helping contribute to the intellectual and cultural life of our society. This is what he'll be doing here this evening in his talk about sacrality and landscape in the Nordic Middle Ages. And just a practical note, after his talk, Tom will be fielding the questions himself, and we can you know, have more of a formal discussion, and then we'll break <coughs> and have a reception, and we can continue the conversation. So please join me in welcoming Tom Dubois. Thank you so much for having me, Ingrid, for inviting me, and for um, thank you to the university and to all of you who have come. Um, I hope uh, I will give you something that we can talk about together and think about some, I, I think, very important uh, issues that uh, we all can wor work forward on. And you'll see what I mean in a minute. But um, I'm going to tell you about uh, four things and, and try to do that in, in this <laughs> enough time that I make, make sense of them to you, but not so that you get overwhelmed. Uh, and then we can have time for discussion. And those four <coughs> things are what did I mean by an indigenous studies perspective and to think about how people in North America can talk about the Nordic medieval period and what perspectives our very problematic but important history with indigenous communities in North America and particularly with sacred spaces uh, can, can contribute to an understanding of medieval materials. So what is an indigenous North American understanding or what can we learn from the experience of indigenous um, uh, meetings with European largely Christian colonizers uh, in historical perspective and how can that teach us about the Nordic Middle Ages? That's the number one question. Secondly, what happened in the Christianization of the Nordic region in relation to sacred space, and I'll give you some very concrete examples from the sagas and from some of the archaeology uh, in that in that region, and then uh, kind of briefly talk about what was lost and and um, thinking about two areas in which that Christianization led to a uh, a, re a, a tragic reduction of the way in which sacrality was performed and understood in the Nordic region, uh, and then what are wet paths forward uh, in a kind of a spirit of ecumenism and, and as we are in a, a center for this, the um, celebration and study of religion in modern life, thinking about uh, the dialogues that can happen between religions from different worldviews, uh, different ways of understanding it, particularly as related to sacred space, but more broadly to the environment as a whole and to the way in which we, we uh, live within uh, this place that we share as the earth. So I want to start with just uh, making, a, again, in a, in a sense, an acknowledgement of the many very important indigenous spaces that are part of the sacrality uh, of North America, places like the Petroglyph National Monument in New Mexico, which uh, has a whole series of really wonderful uh, images. This was a volcano many, many thousands of years ago, and there was a black basalt uh, uh, coating on all the rocks that native peoples um, scratched off and made these images over time that were important, and they are facing the sunrise. So this was a very sacred place. Uh, for many generations, and it's now a national uh, uh, landmark and in the United States, and a, a very wonderful kind of connection of this place to a people and to a history that goes back tens of thousands of years. Uh, Jim Inot, a wonderful uh, artist and um, intellectual at the Zuni uh, uh, Reservation, talking about the way in which he uses his art to celebrate sacred spaces within the Zuni world and how those spaces connect back to, as he says, their umbilical, the Zuni river is the umbilical cord connecting us back to the place we came out of Mother Earth. 
So the idea of the earth as our mother, as a place that we came out of, is a very widespread and important aspect of many indigenous uh, worldviews in North America, and a really potent one to think about as we, we move forward. This is one of those sacred spaces on the uh, uh, Zuni Reservation, Doa Yalane, the Corn Mountain. It's the home of the uh, deities of rain and thunder and lightning, but also in the 1500s, it was the place that uh, Zuni people were able to take refuge when uh, the conquistadors came looking for gold uh, and came to that place. And then in the 1692 uh, Zuni revolt, uh, they again uh, were able to uh, stay on, on uh, Doa Yelane and, and impose on the, the deities for uh, refuge uh, during that, that um, battle with the Mexicans. And then, uh, very wonderfully, it is a place that because it remains part of the Zuni reservation, Zuni people can make choices about who can be on that, and they have decided to restrict it only to Zuni community members. So it's a sacred space that connects to the worldview that's in the whole hands and the decision making of that native community and they have um, are happy with telling about it and, and also sharing images of what it looks like on top of it, but it is a place that is reserved for, for um, uh, native uh, Zuni community members. Another place that's really fascinating and maybe a little closer to home to where we are right now is um, a place in the north of the state that I live in, in Wisconsin, Madeline Island, which in the Ojibwe understanding of the sacred prophecies is a place that the Ojibwe were, were uh, encouraged or asked to go uh, when they were on the Atlantic coast uh, hundreds of years ago. Uh, they received the prophecy to go uh, follow the St. Lawrence River to the place where food grows on water and that of course turned out to be the Menominee or the, uh, the wild rice and they found it on Madeline Island and Madeline Island is a place that is in many ways the center of uh, Ojibwe culture uh, in the South Lake Superior uh, region. It also is a place that is close to this island, Strawberry Island, which is on the Lac de Flambeau Reservation where I do a lot of work. And this was one of the plots of land that was, this island was part of the uh, treaty uh, um, reservation, but was um, during the 1888 Dawes Act was uh, uh, lost to the tribe ended up in white ownership and remained uh, off limits to the tribe uh, for a very, very long time. And it was only in the last two years that the tribe has been able to raise the money to regain ownership of this island, which was sacred to uh, Ojibwe people. Closer to home in Canada, um, the St. Victor Petroglyph site, Do you, have you been to this place if you're driving in? It is a wonderful, wonderful, very moving spiritual place uh, where different uh, people from a variety of different um, communities in that region of what we call Saskatchewan um, uh, had spirit quests. And, and when they were done with the spirit quests, they would make images in the rock that reminded them or stated who they had, what their uh, experience was at. And it's just a, a gorgeous landscape to look out at and to think about the way in which sometimes sacred space is used, not just as emergence and in terms of that, that um, notion of uh, the Zuni place or uh, a place to come to as in Madeline Island, but a place in which to have a spiritual experience, to have this kind of spirit quest or this um, understanding of one's place in a wider cosmos and what that, that role is going to be for somebody in their lives. So it, it's a place that has been that for thousands of years and the petroglyphs show us. Other places in Canada like, like the Squamish uh, or the Squamish uh, Siwash Rock in 
Vancouver, is this one familiar to you? Have you visited this in Stanley Park? Um, kind of an insulting thing, the way there's a road that goes right by it, but a, a rock that, according to Squamish people, was a person that was transformed into a rock for particular reasons uh, and watches over the community in that way. And this rock that, is this one familiar to you? This, um, uh, a very sacred buffalo child stone, uh, which was right where they were going to build the dam and eventually was blown up and um, submerged and uh, was only recently uh, kind of recovered in, it, it still remains at the bottom of Lake Diefendorfer. So there, there it is, that image, but uh, sometimes indigenous spaces don't get respected, in other words. Um, in the United States, there were a number of laws that have been uh, developed over the years, in particular the, the American Indian Religious Freedom Act of 1978 that said that public uh, organizations, public um, institutions should accommodate Indian religious practices. Sounds great on paper, right? but in fact, um, when we look at the, the, the fact, indigenous spaces, though sacred, though um, uh, Indian uh, community members and lawyers have argued very, very passionately and very persuasively about these places. Nonetheless, the Cherokee attempt to halt the Teleco Dam in 1980, dam built anyway. The Diné attempt to halt the flooding of the Rainbow Bridge, flooded anyway. A Hopi attempt to halt the ski resort on San Francisco Peaks in the Cocosino National Forest, built anyway. See a pattern? <laughs> Anyways, you know, this is, part of the, this is part of the colonial experience of North America, and it's not over. Uh, places like um, uh, Matlopaha, uh, the uh, Bear Butte, uh, remains a place that is uh, fought over by people who want to use it for um, uh, its indigenous uh, sacred purposes in the past, and then people who want to have beer bashes there and radio and motorcycle fests in the same space and so that sign by um, a Lakota a demonstrator, don't desecrate Bear Butte, respect our church. Right? That's this idea of place as being a place to have that sacred experience. Or Devil's Lodge, Devil's Tower or Bear's Lodge, uh, a very, very important sacred spot that is today, again, a spot in the United States where there's uh, a lot of conflict between people who want to see it respected, especially at uh, midsummer when it is a, a traditionally a place to have spirit quests, and then people who want to climb it, uh, rock climbers, uh, during midsummer. Uh, and so these different, the National Park uh, trying to uh, speak to both those audiences in what becomes a very polarized um, discussion. And lastly, uh, the uh, Standing Rock protests and the way in which uh, space and resources and uh, protecting our resources becomes a spiritual act for communities. So there's a lot of indigenous history of place that uh, is something that creates its own uh, history and its own perspective that North Americans uh, have been part of and that can inform the way that we look at the medieval period, if we let it. Um, the Church of Sweden had their own kind of soul-searching uh, act where they wanted to look back at the way in which indigenous Sami people had been treated by the church over time uh, and created a really uh, fantastically earnest and important um, uh, soul-searching process called the White Paper Project uh, and it, it resulted in a very long uh, book and a lot of um, uh, dialogue between the Sami community and the Church of Sweden. But um, one of the things that was a, a, an issue in it, uh, and this is my kind of snipey paraphrase of the, the review I just did of the book, was we like to say sorry to all the humans we have injured. In other words, the, the, the project was all about the effects of 
colonization on people, but there was no saying sorry to the rocks. There was no saying sorry to the sacred spaces. There was no saying sorry to the, to the animals and to the colonization affected everyone. And from the Sami point of view, as with many indigenous communities in North America, uh, people don't necessarily see themselves as separate from a wider community of, of species and places and beings. So if you're going to say sorry, why don't you say sorry to everyone that you affected, right? So that was, that was part of my, my, um, uh, my review. And, and the, the members of the church were very receptive to that and said, yes, that's what we'll do as the next, as the next part of this project. But I quoted to them something that Johann Tordi said. He was the man, Sami man, who wrote the first um, book in Sami language in 1910, Winter of Sami And he says in this, this um, statement, and in olden times, all the animals, this is his, his description of the last judgment, the Christian last judgment. And he says, in olden times, all the animals and trees and rocks and everything found on earth uh, will found on earth was able to talk, and they will be able to talk again at the last judgment. What is he saying? He's saying that animals and rocks and trees, they have feelings too, and they're important to say sorry to as well. So they're saying that in 1910. Right? So it's a really interesting thing. That is what I'm, I'm going to suggest to you as an, an indigenous perspective. If we look at the materials that we have from the medieval period, what can we say about the way in which people understood landscape before Christianity came to the Nordic region? Was it anything like these kind of notions that we see and know of in North America? And how did that change? And when I wrote the book that um, uh, Ingrid so kindly uh, mentioned there, Nordic Religions in the Viking Age, I was operating in the way that a lot of people in the field of uh, Nordic medieval studies thought about Christianization of the Nordic region, that there was a Norse pre-Christian religion and then there was Christianity. And what I was ignoring, as a lot of scholars were, was the big elephant in the room, which was Roman religion, Roman pre-Christian religion, and the way in which that influenced both early Christianity and also uh, Christianity after Constantine, and then how it also um, uh, than Christianity, uh, and also had an influence on the pre-Christian Nordic religions. So there was influence coming from Rome in two ways into the Nordic region. And I'll kind of give you some examples of that now, but especially from that Roman framework, we have this move happening in the religious sacral life of Northern Europe, or the Nordic region, from places that are holy, because uh, that are natural places, becoming human places, localized, becoming centralized, this worldly about having a, a stone here that we are doing a spirit quest to an otherworldly, thinking about a heaven somewhere else, a reciprocity in which you ask for things and then you give some of your, your successful harvest or your successful fishing to the rock afterwards, uh, that reciprocity versus submission, individuality versus a societal framework in this egalitarian notion to a more hierarchical one. And I want to take you to that, a place that's really important to a number of the Sami people that I'm, I'm, I work closely with, and it is this island called Rauta, this um, lake called Rautasjärvi uh, in northern Sweden. And at the end of this uh, lake, uh, there is a really important uh, sacred site that's called a Sjeti in Sami, and it's at the base of this uh, mountain that's called Vijachoka. So we have this very um, steep mountain at the end of a lake, and down at the base of it, I'll be out of the camera for a second, but um, there's this rock uh, area there, and that is, I can do it this way, oh. <coughs> that is, oh, sorry, the place called um, Orit. It's a sacred site. So uh, there was, alongside it, there's a river that is, is um, called Biasinyere, and that is a place that women were not allowed to cross any closer to that space. So one of the ways it was kept sacred was that women didn't go there, 
Um, and when they were, they were coming close to it, they had to take a detour uh, in order to uh, uh, respect the spirit that was part of that uh, sacred space. And men would go there and would um, make offerings. It's a place with this really striking, can you see the blue there? It's a streak of malachite that you can see from a long way off, even halfway across the lake. It's got this really um, remarkable um, streak of malachite. And uh, at the base of it was this kind of sandy area. And this is where Sami people for many, many thousands of years made offerings. So when they wanted a success in reindeer husbandry, they would make an offering here, uh, and then they would have success from that. Uh, a Swedish um, uh, archaeologist, this was the very first uh, place excavated, or one could call it plundered, by the um, <laughs> Swedish archaeologist, came and vacuumed up all that stuff that was at the bottom of that um, uh, sacred site and put it into catalogs and was very exciting. 250 coins, 150 bracteates or fancy um, uh, badges. Uh, the coins were from uh, Anglo-Saxon and um, uh, Danish kings, so from very far away and they were being given to this, this sacred site as, as favors and other kinds of, of objects that were being placed there and were uh, stolen from the Sami people uh, in a sense and taken to museums and, and put away. But the place was really important and remains sacred to Sami even if a lot of those gifts that had been given to safety were taken away. And there's in the middle of the lake a place for the dead, Yami uh, which is a um, uh, a place where people would commemorate their dead family members. So we have a lake, a steep mountain, a sacred site, a restriction against um, women coming close to it, and different kinds of gifting of objects to that place. Uh, this is another uh, one of those sites that continues to be a place that people make offerings to. It's called Seita uh, in uh, near Tana in northern Norway. Uh, and this uh, is a really interesting safety uh, or stone because it has a partner on the other side of the river and one in the bottom of the river as well. So it, you, can, you can give it an offering to any one of them and it also uh, will share it with the others. So there's this kind of very rich understanding of the way in which the earth is connected and the, the gifts we give happen. And these are really wonderful things that have, in fact, parallels in some of the old Norse materials we have from the Viking Age and later. Uh, and we know that Norwegians coming to Iceland brought some of these local traditions with them. Uh, so they would, may not have been Sami, but they shared some of the same religious ideas that Sami people did. And they brought those to Norway, they brought those to Iceland. And for instance, we have uh, a story about a settler uh, called Thorstein Rednose, and it's said in the Landnamabok, or the Book of Settlement of Iceland, that he used to make sacrifices to the waterfall, and he left the leftovers, uh, all the leftovers from meals had to be thrown into it. The night he died, all the sheep got swept into the waterfall by a gale. So he was giving the waterfall gifts uh, in order to have success in his sheep husbandry and at the end of his life the the spirits took back those sheep. <laughs> the, the deal was over, right? So that, that was the way in which that worked. So we have this happening in Iceland and being remembered that this was uh, something that happened. Uh, we also have other places in the Norse world where we see exactly the same kind of uh, landscape as what I just showed you in, up in north in Brautfjärvi. This place in southern uh, Norway called Kautbang or Skiringsal was its medieval Old Norse name. And there we see a lake that's called Vetrir or the Lake of the Spirits, a steep mountain that's called Helgafell or the Holy Mountain, and then a sacred place at the base of it where there were all sorts of offerings being made. Those offerings go back about 2,000 years. So exactly the same kind of a framework as we saw in the north was also something that um, Scandinavians 
uh, we're doing in the South as well, uh, and has been corroborated by uh, all sorts of archaeology and place names and so forth. Also interesting is that there begins to be a thing site there. So people begin to meet there in order to have communal, uh, communal um, uh, decision making, but also communal rights, communal um, sharing of rituals. So we have this idea of making personal uh, gifts, but also meeting in this place and having a kind of communal gifts happening. This also comes to Iceland as well. And this is the place that's on the poster that you, that you made so wonderfully, called Helgefell in northern uh, Norway. And it is a really distinctive mountain in itself. Did you notice how it's steep on one end? Right? And that's the end that faces the water. So here's a mountain that looks a lot like that framework that I've been telling you was something that we see in Scandinavia. And there it is from the other side when you're on the fjord, you see how it kind of sticks out. And it must have been a really important navigating device for people in the early medieval period when they were coming in the 900s to this region. Um, that's, you can see it's not the largest mountain in the area because look at these great big ones over here, right? <laughs> Much taller. But it's a very distinctive mountain in itself. Uh, and it's a place that according to the sagas, according to the Bigya saga, uh, we hear about the settler Thorolf uh, coming and it says Thorolf threw overboard the high seat pillars from the temple he had had in Norway uh, with the figure of Thor carved on them and declared that he would settle in any place in Iceland where Thor chose to send the pillars ashore. And Thor chose to send them right in this place in front of that mountain. Uh, uh, on the tip of the headland to the north of the creek, they saw where Thor had come ashore with the pillars. It has been called Thor's nest ever since. So we have this kind of transferal of this idea of the sacred space to Iceland uh, by the, um, the uh, uh, people uh, who are settling from Norway. Uh, and uh, Erbiga also Erbiga Saga also says, on that headland stands a mountain, and the mountain thrown over had so sacred that no man should turn his gaze there unwashed, and nothing should be killed on the mountain, neither cattle nor humankind, until it had left of its own will. That mountain <coughs> he called Helgefell, or Holy Mountain, and he believed that he would go there to that headland when he died with all his kin. So do you see, are you seeing the patterns? You see, the patterns this way of, of saying this is a sacred place. We have to restrict what goes on there. And it's also a place associated with the dead, also a place that we make uh, offerings, and also a place where the first thing uh, is done, an assembly. So at the very base of that, there's a, a thing site. And um, it's said in the Saga that Thor over used to preside over the assembly, or the thing, on the point of the headland where Thor had come to shore. And that was where he started the district assembly. The place was so holy, he would let no one desecrate it, either with bloodshed or with excrement. And for a privy, they had to use a special rock in the sea they called Shit Island. <laughs> so there we have this kind of wonderful story about something that, that from an indigenous perspective, you can say, oh, I see this, this kind of is like what we see in other parts of the world, this way of this very natural, localized area, but we're beginning to have more of a, a beginning of things like a communal thing uh, uh, events happening at it as well. The thing assembly site is added probably in the 800s uh, to that region, and then uh, by the 900s, a new uh, part of the sacrality is added, a hall, and this is a very large, uh, dining hall for uh, sacred uh, objects. This is what that hall looks like now that it's been excavated in the reconstructions. It looks like that. These are the kind of classic Viking halls that we hear about. Um, that's about 130 feet or 40 meters long, so really a massive uh, building in itself. Inside, it would have looked like this. This was the traditional uh, Icelandic um, uh, building, and I am a folklorist, and so I love sheep. <laughs> Stuff. This is a sheep house in modern Iceland, and you see that inside it's got exactly that same architecture, right? So this, this way of building was something that was very important. 
But also, what's interesting is that they found that the walls had been painted white. The out, outer walls had been painted white. So often we look at this and say, oh, this was distinctively Viking. But perhaps for the people at the time that they were building this, they were trying to look like Rome. They were trying to look like a Roman temple with this space, right? That Roman influence. A big man has a big place and has a big parties where he sits in a central seat and uh, gives gifts to his friends. Uh, we have amulets and images and gradually the god Odin becomes more and more important as this kind of embodiment of this aristocratic chieftain character that starts to develop in, in late uh, heathen tradition uh, before the coming of Christianity. But it's very much like a Roman uh, mansion and the way that Roman religion uh, worked. Uh, and women have specific roles to be um, about, uh, cup bearers and to be um, uh, helping uh, do that, uh, the sacral act of feasting as a ritual act in itself. We find these on Goldlandic picture stones as well, uh, where it's often associated with the god Odin, and we see these uh, in various places. And this idea of the noble uh, chieftain who's going to have a following of men who will help him in battle, and then they will have, uh, they will get to Valhalla afterwards. It's all a kind of a, uh, an add-on to that earlier religious tradition that's happening in late um, paganism before the coming of, of Christianity. Old Uppsala is another place where we can see one of these uh, hills that was very steep down to a water uh, that gradually gets uh, added these burial mounds of kings. So I want to say that I'm an important person, so I'm going to bury my relatives in a great big monument right next to this sacred space. So we have this um, kind of association of people with these spaces and these spaces taking on their, their um, sacrality and sharing it with chieftains and kings who want to um, uh, associate themselves with that place. And the different things that we find in there, uh, we can see this kind of uh, sacrality uh, continuing on. So we're moving towards um, uh, more and more of the kind of centralized, we're beginning to have human places like halls as places where you can have a sacred uh, event. And we're moving away from those natural places, but they're still often in more or less the same spot. So here's what we're having in our hall, but over there is the mountain where the ancestors used to do it. And there's the, the lake where people for thousands of years did the rituals. So it's kind of in the same spot, in a way. Um, and as we bring in, come into Christianity then, we have interesting, surprise, surprise, the churches being built exactly in the same places. So right in that same skating style site, there's a church and eventually a, um, a, a Christianity kind of adds itself into that, that place. The, the, uh, the church that gets built there, also in uh, Iceland at um, a thing that lived or the big all thing, uh, a very sacred place in the pre-Christian Icelandic tradition gets its own church as well. I won't read you all of that, but here in uh, Helgefell, what do you see there on the gentle side of the mountain? The church, right? That's what you do is add add that into the um, story. And then uh, also on the very top of that mountain, they built a chapel as well. So there, there is that chapel on the top, or the remains of that chapel on the very top of Helgefell. Uh, Old Uppsala, there's the church. You're finding these churches in exactly those places. And of course, that all has to do with things that Pope St. Gregory said back in the 600s when he said, uh, the uh, Monte Cassino, which was a, um, a, a place for the uh, worship of, the, of Apollo, uh, becomes the first monastery and they um, uh, destroy the grove uh, dedicated to demon worship, uh, is cut down, 
And Benedict, the man of God, arrived. He smashed the idol, overturned the altar, and cut down the grove of trees. He built a chapel dedicated to St. Martin in the Temple of Apollo, and another to St. John, where the altar of Apollo had stood. And he summoned the people of the district by faith by his unceasing preaching. So we have this kind of very violent usurpation of this place, supplanting the um, pre-Christian religious tradition with this new one. And of course, that becomes the very famous statement of Pope St. Gregory to uh, missionaries in Northern Europe, do the same. Wherever they have a sacred spot, get rid of their idols, and then make it Christian. <coughs> so the supplantation is part of that medieval Christian idea. Uh, and then that church becomes its own cosmos with its own sacrality, which is lockable and which is containable, which isn't a natural site anymore, and which we can control access to, we can keep people out if they're not good Christians, and we can have this kind of a much more consolidated uh, religious system. On the sacred stones, uh, where there had been Odin and feasting, there's now the cross. And that cross is, again, a way of saying, this is who we are now, and this is who's on top uh, in that, that story. The, the inscription here is all about um, uh, the people who killed my sons in battle. May they rest in hell, <laughs> and so forth. But it was, it's, a great, it's a great stone. So what was lost in that area? I'm coming to the end of my of my time, and I just want to um, uh, note, note that there were two really important losses in that Roman slash Christian uh, approach to sacred space and to the way in which uh, people uh, dealt with the sacred. And one of those was that sacred places, now that we have churches, become places for demons. They become demonized in different ways. And if you read the saga, called the saga of, of uh, Eric the Red about um, the Vinland uh, colony, you'll hear about this guy Thorhaler Begermadr, or Thorhal the uh, hunter, uh, who goes out and um, in the story, uh, they can't find any food, and he makes a sacrifice to Thor in a natural place. Sound familiar, right? And they get a big whale comes to shore, and he says, ha ha, look, my prayer to Thor was successful. Thor Hall came up and said, didn't old Redbeard prove to be more help than your Christ? This whale was my payment for the poem I composed about Thor, my guardian, who seldom disappointed me. And then all the Christians in the, the comments, once they heard that, that no one wanted to eat the whale meat, they cast it off the cliff and threw themselves on God's mercy. So, so we have this demonizing of the natural. That is a kind of logical uh, corollary to creating these human spaces that we can control. And the other thing that happens is that um, the, the leadership roles of women in sexuality become um, uh, replaced by a very meek, very important, but very meek Mary, who um, is more or less a, um, a helper and a, a mourner for her son, but not anywhere like these medieval <laughs> chieftain women that we read about in the sagas, like uh, Thor leader um, sound filler, <coughs> Lana Maboka, who um, uh, during a famine in Haulogaland in northern Norway, uh, she filled every sound with fish by means of magic. She also marked out the Kvyar fishing ground in Isafjordr Bay in Iceland and took a hornless ewe in return from every farmer in Isafjordr. So she was a religious leader. She was a woman. And that was okay. That was part of that centrality. Uh, and the, in the saga of the Christian, Christianizing of Iceland, we read about this woman, uh, Frigerder, who is um, busy uh, uh, working in the temple while the Christian uh, comes to try to um, uh, uh, convince people to join uh, Christianity, and he. Uh, Thorvald, the, the, the missionary, uh, makes up this poem. I preach the precious faith. No man paid heed to me. We got scorn from the sprinkler, the priest's son of blood tip branch. When without any sense, that old tro troll wife against the poet, may God crush that priestess, shrilled at the heathen author. So he's really angry at this woman, in other words, for getting the better of a, 
being more successful in keeping people in the old religion than he was in, in attracting them to um, Christianity. And finally, as a, one more example of those women uh, having this role, Versa Tauter, a really wonderful, interesting uh, story about a woman who um, uh, harvests the uh, uh, penis of the slaughtered horse and then uses it in daily rituals. And this is what uh, everybody uh, passes it around and they have a kind of a ritual that this woman is in charge of. And this all happens uh, very orderly until one day King St. Olaver comes <laughs> and discovers it and throws it to the dogs. And then we, uh, uh, we hear that with God's help and Olaf's zeal, they finally all accepted the faith and were baptized by the court's court chaplain. They observed the faith ever since and they became aware of the object of the faith, <coughs> learned to know their maker and realized the evil and perversity of their former ways which are despicable to all good men. <laughs> so, so these earlier, there's something lost in that sacrality. Right? So finally, what are paths forward then? What can all of this teach us about uh, things? I go back to that uh, story of the, the Sami uh, uh, white paper project and for what Johan Tori uh, said, in the olden times, all the animals and trees and rocks and everything found on earth was able to talk and they will be able to talk again at the Last Judgment. Johann Tori is Sami, but he's also a very active Christian, and from his point of view, he, ha he has no trouble understanding that sacred places can still be sacred in Christianity too, right? He's finding a place for a sacred place within uh, Christianity. And that is something that um, certainly is part of the way in which the uh, Sami White Paper Project uh, is thinking about what they'll do in relationship to place in the future. These, these notions of documenting the wrongdoing, admitting what we've done to uh, sacred places, acknowledging that guilt, restoring the injured parties, uh, and then hoping for forgiveness uh, as a result. The process can also happen with places and with how we uh, try to reverse some of the damage that's been done to sacred places or environments over time. And that is, again, in the notion of a way forward where the leadership of Native uh, spiritual leaders can help uh, chart a way for uh, broader uh, dominant culture members. The whole uh, Standing Rock movement, uh, very actively engaged Christian organizations and um, lots of Christian churches uh, we're part of that, that process in a very, very active way, coming to Standing Rock and so forth. And so this is really kind of the battleground for thinking about what our relationship with the earth will be and how that will be part of uh, our future, whatever our religious uh, views are. And if you don't think that there's a battle going on about that, think about the way in which Pope Francis and his climate encyclical has been viewed by uh, uh, right-wing folks in my country and, and, um, and how also uh, this from last week in which uh, evangelicals, um, this is um, uh, Pat Robinson uh, warning of Donald Trump's decision to remove U.S. forces from Syria saying that the president was, quote, in danger of losing the mandate of heaven. In other words, all the other things he did to the environment were just fine, but now with Syria, now he might lose the mandate of heaven. Sorry to be irreverent there about the president, but <coughs> you, you see the point that there's this struggle going on within uh, uh, ecumenical understandings of the world. What is our responsibility from a faith perspective towards the earth, towards the resources, towards those things that have been sacred from, for many people and many cultures for many thousands of years, what, what are we called to do uh, in relationship to those? And I hope that gives you thought, cause to think, and um, I'll end there by thanking you. Gihto. You've got to have questions after that. <laughs>
for asking that question because that's a wonderful one um, with that's particularly at that site but in a lot of the sites having to do also uh, Viking Age sites there was a restriction that women didn't do certain things it didn't mean that they weren't sacred and in fact there were a lot of rituals that were going on in the home uh, at the local temple that's where we see Frigelder doing her ritual acts so there was a place there was a complementarity of gender and women were doing the ritual acts they were doing in one space, and then these places uh, in the nat nat natural um, landscape were often places where men did the, the ritual acts. But they were, these were seen as equally important. And um, one of the things that um, uh, Johann Thor, um, uh, Mikael Svoni's great uncle, who led one of the first archaeologists to that site, uh, one came and said, well, why can't women come here? And, and his response was, because women have a sacredness uh, and this place has a sacredness and those two can't be in the same place. So there's this, it wasn't that women didn't have an important sacrality, but it was this, there were these kind of complementarity of religious actions that was there. So I hope that makes yeah, yeah. sense in a certain sense. And what is uh, interesting is that within Christianity, there really the women's there are women's sacred roles in medieval Christianity, but they're so much more subordinated than men. So it's not a by any means a, an equal framework anymore. It's much more like that uh, after the Christianization. Yes. Sir. Could, could you say a little more about the? You said the women had a certain sacrality and the place had a certain sacrality, but the two shouldn't mix. Yes. Could you say a little more about that, please? Well, uh, in the Sami context, anyways, the you when you build the guahti, there's goddesses that live underneath where you place that, so they come with that space and they inhabit underneath it. So under the hearth of the household was Sarahka, and then behind, uh, at the door was Uksahka, the goddess that guards the door, and then there was Yuksahka, who took care of the men's weapons. Uh, and those, those three goddesses were really important in people's lives. You, women were the ones who did sacrifices to those, and those uh, goddesses moved wherever people had their house. So they were ones that uh, women were in charge of, whereas these sacred spots were kind of in the landscape in one place, and they weren't moved, and those are ones that men went to. So there was just almost a kind of a ballet to it, right? That there's these gods, deities that are moving with the community that women are, are dealing with, and then these um, deities who are fixed in a place that men have the responsibility of going to. Uh, and um, and that that's kind of these two roles that's being uh, played out, and it's hard to know exactly how that played out in the Norse material, but there's evidence in the sagas that there were similar kinds of uh, dualities going on within that. Yes. Thank you. Um, I I don't really know much about this sort of early time period that you're talking about. Could you, um, but I, I'm very interested in the fact that you brought up um, sort of the Roman influence. Um, could yes. you maybe explain a little more about how that Roman influence got um, to Nordic areas? Um, and yeah. Um, it, uh, archaeologically, it seems to have been there already in the 300s. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and uh, that is, of course, the time where everybody wants to trade with Rome. <laughs> and Rome is a very prestigious thing to Northern Europe. And, uh, and that continues into the Carolingian period as well. Uh, and, um, and that's where we find very active um, uh, kind of, you, in order to, um, to <coughs> trade with uh, the Carolingian Empire, or which calls itself the inheritor of Rome right at that time, you have to be a Christian. So there's this, these two kinds of ways in which that is coming into the region. But we find already in the, the uh, 400s, um, the beginnings of this, this hall culture, these mansion cultures, beginnings of other kinds of uh, material culture that seems to be imitating uh, uh, aristocratic life in the, um, the uh, Mediterranean world. And then we have these details in late paganism, like that um, the god Odin only drinks wine. Well, there's no wine produced in Scandinavia, right? So that's like this overtly Roman thing, right? That's saying, you know, we're like the Romans. And, and, and there it is. It's very clear in the text, but, but Archula, um, scholars of Old Norse religion really didn't think about it for a long time. Like, well, of course. Wine is great to drink, <laughs> but wine means something very specific in this, this notion. Uh, as do really fancy um, mansions, which don't make a lot of sense uh, in terms of resources for the Nordic region and for uh, weatherproofing <laughs> and so forth. They work great in the Mediterranean world, but um, they uh, imply a, a, a much larger kind of uh, population base than, than was the case in most of these places where they were being built. So they were being built in order to uh, assert uh, uh, an aristocratic station that was much higher than one's neighbors, and that would lead to um, being able to be the chieftain and uh, levy taxes on your neighbors and also maintain uh, a temple as part of that. Is that? Is yeah, that's yes, sir. Yes, sir. Question. Uh, it's kind of peaked by a catalog of coins uh, that yeah. was thrown into that sacred lake. Yeah. Uh, the coin uh, from England bearing Ethelred's face on it. Yeah. Uh, fascinating because it's so late. I'm wondering uh, about the way that Christianity supplants the old Norse religions, not, uh, particularly how, how abrupt that kind of transition is. Basically, I'm, I'm wondering, was, were there any groups of communities, particularly maybe monastic communities, that were trying to preserve uh, or conserve these older Norse traditions? Because I'm thinking particularly of someone like Alcuin, who's writing yeah. to abbots and saying, you know, why are you reading these stories of the, the, the Norse gods, burn yes. all that stuff? Yes. I mean, do, you, do you get a sense that in Norse traditions, there's, there are scribes like the scribes who copy Babel. Do you want to kind of preserve it, even if they're domesticating it in a Christian context? It's a, that's a great question, and it, and it is one of the interesting things about these Icelandic texts that we do have. Things like Landnama book are talking about sacred acts that are done to the landscape, and they're acknowledging that this was going on. Uh, and partly they're hedging the way they say that by saying, of course, this is before people knew the retru or the, the proper religion, and they were in ignorance, and so they did these things. But there's every evidence that people were continuing to do those rituals right into the 19th century or, or 20th century. So uh, outside of these um, uh, courts of power or um, centers of power, people were practicing the old, the old religion, the old practices right alongside the Christianity and having no problem with that at all. So in this sense, sometimes the sagas are kind of <coughs> hinting at that, and they'll talk about things like, like um, Völsathalter talking about this, this custom with this um, horse penis that we don't know for sure, but may have been something that somebody knew. You know, they saw these kind of things happening. Uh, we do have customs in the pharaohs where, where uh, weddings were celebrated with with goat penises and they would be preserved and then you made kind of dirty 
jokes about them because wedding is about population <laughs> in a certain sense, right? So you're kind of joking about that idea, but there's also a, a sacrality to that that's behind there. So there must have been uh, a lot of this, um, a lot of Scandinavians will say, well, we never did Christianize. <laughs> we really just kind of took it by name. But um, I think that there's this kind of meshing of the religions in, that went on for hundreds of years and that um, uh, is something that makes uh, there be evidence for that, uh, the kind of sacrality of the place that has parallels to what we find in North America. Yeah. Yes? I'm interested in your number four and pass forward and specifically in relation to Lake Erie and the recent legal appropriation that the lake is having rights for having been so polluted and yeah. disregarded. And that's not a traditional beginning in the US, but it seems to be linked to a worldwide movement that may have sacrality and landscape yeah. attached to it as much as it does the legal changes yeah. that are brought there. Yeah, I believe that the beginning of that movement is, is the Brazilian Pachamama, the, the notion of the, the inherent rights of the land in, that was incorporated into Brazilian law uh, and um, is a kind of a, an indigenous, it's a piece of indigenous worldview becoming codified as law uh, and then uh, land as having rights, as having a per personhood in a sense, and you find that happening in a, a number of other parts of the indigenous world now in New Zealand, uh, that's happened as well, and now that example that you're giving with Lake Erie is another one of those, kind of acknowledging the rights of landscape and so forth. And I think that that becomes one of the things that's um, uh, where that we push against the, the kind of uh, Christian frameworks that um, Canadian and American society were built on uh, and the way in which um, so many of the sacred sites in, in uh, the United States you can recognize because they're called devil's something. So wherever was a sacred spot for the can native community became, became devil's tower or devil's lake or devil's whatever else. So this demonizing of the landscape uh, instead of this respecting of the rights uh, and the personhood of that landscape. It's a really different way of understanding nature. And I guess it's our challenge, can we, can we embrace that um, personhood of, of space? Has there been any parallel between the Swedish story, or sorry, and the story in the U.S. churches? Um, the, 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 um, the reconciliation process? Um, that is, that, I don't know if the, um, the Lutheran Church in America has done that process. Um, it was something that was initiated at the World Lutheran Conference in Brazil in uh, 2000 and then was taken up by the Swedish uh, State Church um, in 2015 through 17. Uh, so it's fairly recent. That um, process uh, and uh, um, and very needed, very needed. <laughs> so, yeah. So, would you say that that uh, redeveloping um, a consciousness of a relation to ship to society could begin by the human just simply apologizing for their errors of ignorance? <laughs> well, um, you know, I think that one of the things that uh, <coughs> within that, that Swedish framework that they posited, uh, and it was actually a uh, Sami uh, theologian, Gunnar, uh, Bjarnar Gunnarsson, who came up with this idea that there's these four stages of reconciliation. And the first is acknowledging, documenting what happened and the second is acknowledging it. And then the third is um, restoring the acts of restoration, which is the really hard one. And then the fourth is whether that, that being that was hurt forgives you. So it's not one that you have any 
control than the first three, one does have a control and responsibility to do. So um, the first act is um, documenting what's been done, and the second one is, is that guilt. And those are, you can't go to the next until you've done those, but they're not the end in themselves. <laughs> is my answer to what you say. In other words, acknowledging that this, that um, the landscape was uh, destroyed, and that perhaps some of the ways in which um, Christianity uh, taught, or or European Christianity taught about land and resources as being things that humans could control, uh, was uh, a, an act of wrong interpretation or, 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 or hubris that we need to repent in a certain sense and move beyond. Does that answer? <laughs> but that's only the first step. Invisible voice, like a, uh, well, spiritual, spirituality itself to me is about a voice, like it's not somewhere we can go suddenly spiritual. Or yeah. Spiritual. It's about a voice that we're either uh, hearing or sending out a vibration yeah. to. So I think, I just think that if more people were more conscious about uh, just about nature itself. Yes, absolutely. The mass of it. Yeah. That, that we could do a lot of healing for, to humanity and to the earth. Yeah. That's a, that's a beautiful sentiment, and, and it certainly is, um, not only did people not listen to that, but they seem actively not to want to listen, <laughs> sometimes to what nature or the earth is saying to us <laughs> in different ways, uh, and um, sometimes uh, quite emphatically, if we think about things like climate change, uh, and whether we'll listen or not is a question, and, and that, that, that is that, that uh, kind of humility of listening. Uh, that one has to do, uh, and then learning from nature. Certainly indigenous cultures have known that there's a sacrality or there's a way in which you can learn things from being in nature that's different from what you can learn just talking to other human beings. And that's an important thing to acknowledge and to learn from, because uh, uh, if we want to move someday to something that could be something like sustainability, we have to get back to that kind of dialogue with the world that we're part of and not just with other people or stockholders <laughs> in our corporations. Right, so. Let's take yes. another, one more question and then, and then maybe we could continue us in the conversation. On that last point, I was just wondering, do you, do you think there's something inherently theological in a Christian worldview that lends itself to usurpation and supplantation and not recognizing the centrality? <laughs> well, mentioned power as a motivation. I, I asked a, a, um, a Swedish theologian that very same question. And, um, and you know, it is a fact, and we, we kind of take it for granted that Christianity is a, is a phenomenally uh, anthropocentric religion in the sense that it said that God, of all the things that God made, like human beings the best, <laughs> this, these would have a special heaven for them and all those things and I'll make the rest of the world for them. But even given that, uh, this theologian said, and I agree with him, there's plenty of things within uh, the, um, the scriptures and within uh, the life of Jesus and the things he did that can be used to build a, um, a more uh, inclusive spirituality and, and that we can talk about a, a, a Christianity that embraces its environment and that sees the stewardship of the land as something that's the sacred responsibility of human beings. So even within that anthropocentrism, you can find a place for a framework that is um, inclusive of the animals, plants, and we have that already back in the, the um, medieval period with people like um, St. Francis of Assisi and the things he's doing, so it's not like that's not been a part of, of the, the uh, one strand within Christianity since the very beginning, if you think about Jesus going into the mountains and praying and so forth. Uh, so it, it's there, 
But that's what theology does, is it pulls out certain things that are valuable and then builds an understanding that can work in this time and place. And maybe one of the things that an echo um, theology would do within a Christian framework is pull out those things and celebrate them rather than celebrating that the earth is ours to exploit. <laughs> and that's part of our divine mandate from, from God, which is a really problematic thing if we're going to survive on this planet. Thank you very much. And we Thank you all.